The next session is um, uh, from open source bio biological art to DIY scientific instruments. Yeah, okay. So, Mr. Mark, right? Yes. Okay. Mr. Mark sounds good. Okay. Mr. I, <laughs> okay, give hand, please. <laughs> my, my French name is a bit difficult to um, uh, pronounce. So, my real name is Marc Dusseyer. I'm stuck with a French name because in, I'm from Switzerland and somehow it happens that some person from Geneva gets married to a person from the German-speaking part. So I did not grow up French speaking. It, it is correct, Marc? Marc? Marc Dusseyer is my family name. It's a okay. very no, strange I'm name. Sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of echo. Maybe we can put this a bit down. Ah, uh, oh yeah, exactly. Um, so I will talk about Hacteria. That's a combination of hacking and bacteria, which is a project I have been involved for exactly 10 years. We have the anniversary. And I show you a bit also how older projects have influenced this from a local hacker makerspace in Zurich that I'm involved. And I show some projects that happens in the network around Hacteria from a friend, Gaudi Labs, and from the Global Open Science Hardware Network. And I will talk a bit about coconuts. Um, why do I know, talk about coconuts? I don't know. Um, we will see. Maybe this has something to do. So I run a company called the Center for Alternative Coconut Research, um, which some of you have maybe shown some ex seen some example outside. But again, I show a bit of an overview of different projects, not only from myself, um, but I mostly talk about my own personal opinion about these things. I'm not representing a larger group or network with this. I mentioned I'm from Switzerland. Um, this is the least equipped fab lab in the Swiss fab lab network. It's officially a fab lab. Who knows fab labs? No one. And these are shared, um, shared workshops for digital fabrication. Like we have laser cutters, we have 3D printers, and sewing machines or other stuff. Um, with the idea. Mm, yeah, it's just a nice place. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, in fact, it's so Fab Labs are 3D printer. It's manufacturing, um, but I do make some experiments with bacteria and especially with yeasts. It's called brewing, or making wine, or making cheese. Um, so I'm from Switzerland, but I spend a lot of my time in Indonesia, in Taiwan, in at the moment in Bangkok. So that's where the coconut topic came into my life. Um, but for more than 10 years. Um, after I finished a degree in like nanotechnology and biosensors, I started to get more active in arts and culture field in Switzerland. I'm interested in electronic music, and we have a community that really likes to make their own synthesizers, using also open source hardware, also using open source for like computer generated music. And we have a whole community, and we run festivals, we run workshops and events. And this has somehow kind of radically changed a bit my path away from academic research into working with real people in the public sphere. And it's suddenly after my high-end activities on microfluidics and cell-based cell sensors, I started to make this ultra-simple hardware that is a simple oscillator. And we got invited to India, to Indonesia, to Taiwan to do this kind of maker um, do-it-yourself electronics workshops for children. And this was all nice. Suddenly I'm kind of running around the world um, soldering. I invited to Taiwan to teach them how to solder, which was a bit confusing because I thought that's where all the hardware comes from. But um, because it's an art and technology network, it's also the process is very much about creativity and, and interdisciplinary collaboration. Suddenly I work with social workers, with teachers, with designers, freaks, and so forth. And I really started to enjoy that. And, and this is still ongoing. It's not the focus of my talk, but creating creative um, printed circuit boards is also something I still do with this company, the Center for Alternative Coconut Research. Also, this is a collaboration with Indonesian and German partners. It's an open hardware platform to make 8-bit music. Um, it looks like a cassette tape. 8-bit is also from the 80s. And it's also a bit where I got kind of 
whatever, culturally trained. Um, I'm 44 years old already, so my youth was spent and spoiled in the 80s on Commodore 64 computers, and I'm still reenacting them with this kind of PCBs. Um, so it's open hardware, but it's also another creative layer on top of it. I'm happy to share some of this outside. But what I want to talk about is how I started to merge my, my training in nanotechnology and biosensors with this newly found joy in making things and do it yourself. Uh, I developed laboratory courses for students with the goal that the students have to build their own laboratory equipment. It was a nanotech class on microfluidics, but my university where I was teaching doesn't even have these kind of laboratories available. So we used record players to make spin coaters. We used some random UV lamps for certain processes, and we made some microfluidics, and we made some XY stages using um, two, um, these are, I think, CD drives, one this way, one this way, to make a little laser cutter that was to produce our microfluidic devices. So this started as a student like project-based learning, and it's also when we started to build the first microscopes. My hope was that in this hybridity of making um, students DIY and creatively that we could even work with game designers and kind of come up with games that use microorganisms, um, use these nanotech tools, um, yeah. Um, this never really kicked off as an international student competition, but this is a bit where I started to introduce this stuff in my pedagogic approaches. Um, everything I was based on open hardware. This was also the start of Arduino and all that stuff, so I thought students have to learn this. This was in 2008, 9, 10. Um, so one thing um, that I really started to embrace also in open hardware is that it's do it yourself as a pedagogic approach, but it's also do it with others. Do it with others means, on, partially it means collaborative teams. It also means others, people that have a different background, people that have a different skin color, people that are not even people. Maybe the other is a plant. Um, also hopefully make something useful, but not too much. It's good enough if it's good enough or funny. And maybe also create something useful and beautiful. So there is also something else written there. It's called Hack the Planet. Um, when I say hacking, I think in these circles you kind of know it. I do not mean break breaking into security systems. Um, but I also do not mean making. There is a difference between making something and hacking something. And here we see the symbol of the maker movement, the hot glue gun. But a hacker opens it up, look what's inside, and maybe finds a new use of it. So this creative um, insight and kind of re repurposing of something is when I talk about hacking. Um, so 10 years ago, we started a, a, a website called hackdira.org, um, introducing artists and creatives into methodologies to do biology, laboratory biology, field biology, and stuff like this. So similar to what I showed you before in electronics, we wanted to apply on, on biological laboratory methods, on genetics, on working with bacteria, and so forth. And you know, this was still in the 2008-9 when wikis were really cool before Facebook got big. So we installed a wiki and we called it a project. And the first project that we developed as a workshop that I think integrates this is an instruction to build a, a microscope, the most fundamental tool for, let's say, science in many different fields. It extends your view to the small things that our eye cannot see anymore. But we use a webcam, a really cheap one, a consumer product for $3, and we re replace the position of the optics of the lens to turn it into a microscope. And you have to just have some way of holding your sample and putting the light. And this is also a creative process to let people experiment with building the setup to turn this into a microscope. Um, you have to really precisely be able to um, position your sample. So small hands help. And you can use it. And you see microscopic life that you have never, ever seen before. Anybody knows this? 
it's written, yeah. It's a tardigrade, a water bear. It's also the mascot and the logo of our um, project. Um, you see individual cells from your tongue or from, like from the inside of your body. Um, you see yeast cells, blood cells, and stuff like that. It's not a high quality, but still it's like a whoa. And it's a hack because we use a system that was meant to Skype with your grandma to look at your sperm. Um, and because of this DIY workshops, it got really popular. I got invited to many places in the world. We just had a talk about maps. How was it? This is not OpenStreetMap. What's wrong with the map? No. Who said what is up and down? <laughs> um, it's not. I can re read Russian Federation. It's correct. Huh? Mongolia. Indonesia in the center of the world or Thailand. Yeah, so having these opportunities to work in these other places made me also rethink how I look at the world. And us Europeans, we're really spoiled. We really think we're the center of the world. The Mercator projection puts like Germany in the center, but maybe we're just this little half island at the end of Asia. I don't know. Um, so I had opportunities to collaborate with a lot of Indonesian kind of collectives that also work on this art and technology interface. We like to make synthesizers together, we like to make wine together, and it's the first time I saw this, open source chocolate. I did not know how chocolate was produced, just to let you know. I did not know that the fruit looks like this, and I thought we know about chocolate in Switzerland. Um, putting the microscopy project in this context of teaching students um, was a very joyful experience. It's really something useful. Um, we can also modify existing um, equipment with a webcam to create digital images instead of just looking with your eye. But then also, I saw a lot of Arduino projects in, in, in the West, in Europe. They make like a low-cost something temperature controller. Arduino 25 sensor from other fruits, $10 and so forth. The local innovators already sell an incubator for $5 in the store, or I think it's 100,000 rupees, that's $7. And this comes with a thermal controller, a lamp to heat it. This is to breed eggs at home if you have chicken. Um, so a lot of the projects we see as low cost in Europe, in fact, are not low cost. They're considered expensive, I figured out. And in fact, maybe they're already available. Also, I figured out we don't have to build these high-tech tools. For the basic stuff that maybe a farmer really wants to know is, has the temperature of his cacao fermentation been consistent over the last two days? Or has there been a power cut? If so, he maybe has to drop the, the batch. If not, he can sell it twice the price to uh, the next seller. So it's not even about controlling temperature. Just being aware that you had a consistent temperature seems to be the topics the local farmers and my agricultural microbiology student friends are interested. Which is trivial. Huh? If you have a 101 Arduino class, this is what you do in the first lesson. But it has its imp importance. Um, so on one hand, we have application. On the other hand, we have education. And I have been thinking a lot on, on, like, should I sell it as a product, this microscope? But then people think, ah, I don't have the product, I cannot do microscopy. And the idea of open source and instruction should be that the other person takes your knowledge, adapts it to his own environment, maybe even changes it, improves it. And I do think a bit then when we start selling this open source hardware as a kit, we maybe even lose something. So I was really thinking we have to open source the instruction primarily, leave it but as open as possible that the person understands he can do whatever he wants with it. But it doesn't work. Huh? I gave this presentation about the microscope many times, and then afterwards there's a group discussion. Are we allowed to copy that? And when I say open source 100 times, but in these circles we, we know, but very often we have this idea of the, the innovator owns the project. And even patents are not meant that you own that project. Patents are also meant to spread it. It got bad, but somehow, yeah. On the other hand, this picture made us really famous. Huh? So this is a lot of laboratory equipment. 
that we built using recycled hardware, laser cutters. It has predefined files, but people think they need a laser cutter to build it. But in fact, you don't. Most of it is just cases around a piece of hardware, and you can build a case with the hand also. Um, so, what personally my interest is in this open source science hardware is mostly educational and having people understand what's inside of this equipment that you use on a daily basis as a way of learning, as a way of being creative <coughs> and also as an aesthetic output. You see how they all look different. This is the microscope on top, there's one on the bottom and so forth. Um, and what I wanted to say again about this innovation, there is, mom, at the moment, everybody has to be an innovator. If I show you my innovation, you said, ah, oh, I cannot do it anymore. Someone else already did it. And I think the true value of open source hardware is that you use other people's open hardware and make something with it. And we should value that translation in a way, because you will always change it to your local needs. You will change it to your local markets, you maybe make a business with it, and even translating an instruction from English into Thai creates more value than sitting there and coming up with an innovation and then pretending something that's new, ignoring other people's credit and so forth. So I think we should value more in the open hardware environments, the translation, the adopt, adoptation, I don't know, maybe adaptation, and the implementation of projects. Um, the microscope project, I think every school in the world should do it. But we should value that person that goes to the school and not the person that makes a new Kickstarter with the same crap we have seen 100 times ago, just blown up. Um, so to do so, we just have a wiki for 10 years. It's a mess. You will never find anything. Um, take your time or ask people. We also have a forum where you can kind of ask questions. It's forum.hectira.org. And anyway, if, on the main website, you find the links. Um, today, I mostly focus on this laboratory equipment like you see here. I already showed you a bit, you know, from the microscope story, how you can get, take different paths. And um, how this image was so popular because it looks like real science, um, which is purely an aesthetic decision, by the way. A huh? good photographer and white. Um, I, other equipment that we have built over the years, um, and here I uh, personally I like to obviously show these measurement concepts. It's an Arduino. On top of it, we have a laser that goes through some kind of a sample, and most probably you have a light sensor here. Also, these are like Arduino class one like skills for hardware and software, but this is a very fundamental measurement to see how much light goes through a sample, even at a specific wavelength, in this case, red. This tells us the chemistry, this tells us how many particles are in there, and if we combine it with some other reagents, um, we can do proper water analysis. And one issue we have with all this open science hardware is the software is easy to copy, hardware not so, you still have to make it, order it, um, assemble it, but the wetware, the reagents, the molecules, the cells, they're extremely difficult to open source. And quite often you see a paper, open source something um, detector. But in fact, only the hardware and the software is open source. And the reagents you need, the chemicals, are heavily protected, patented, and expensive. So when we talk a system, an open source system, we have to combine also like access to the molecules and the cells to do these experiments. Um, I call it turbidity meter in this case. How turbid is the water, which means how much particles are absorbing the light. Um, I made an educational board where people prototype their own spectrophotometer. It measures absorption of light at a specific wavelength through a specific path. With an Atini, people can prototype with light sensors and then have to build up something that's reproducible, so the measurement from his, from him, can be compared to the measurement from her. Um, so they have to come up with reproducibility of the setup. And if it's an optical setup, don't just put it like this in the air. Build a black box around it. So sometimes black boxes are good when we build um, optical devices. <laughs> so we have also a 3D printed version um, that's even more advanced. And of course, it turns out to be a black box that's 
what you have to make. Um, inside is a webcam and something that's called a grating, which is similar to a prisma. It spreads the light into the different wavelengths. It creates rainbows. Um, because it's a webcam, we can only see the visible light. So what we can see is what kind of colors are in our sample. And everything is connected with an optical fiber. So they go from these rough prototypes to also, let's say, finished GitHub repository that can be easily reproduced. Um, another example is the PCR, um, PCR thermocycler. This is a very standard method for genetic analysis to see the presence of a certain sequence of DNA. Um, again, the reagents are difficult to get, but the way we can see them is by heating it up to 9 degrees, cooling it down to 60 degrees, heating it up to 90 degrees, cooling it down to 60 degrees, and so forth. This is a trivial task for any engineer or any cook. Took, took. So technically, these are very simple things to build. And this is a hairdryer that we hacked to go through these temperature profiles with an Arduino or something. And a more advanced version is a fully manufacturable like Pico or pocket PCR, where even the heat, the heat element here is using PCB manufacturing, which is a very accessible method of fabrication. And yeah, it runs five samples. It's still in process. There's a prototype outside, and it seems to work. Um, I mentioned briefly already this XY scanner that we used for liquid handling. So we put a syringe. On the left side, you see a syringe that we move with the motor from a floppy drive. We have two XY DVD drives to move around the end of the tube. So we have a liquid handling robot, a bit like a 3D printer, but kind of we don't print 3D, we just put drops of bacteria or other molecules on the surface. This has led to more advanced project in laboratory automation. Um, a lot of the biology laboratory experiments are handling liquids, mixing them, um, moving them, and so forth. So Open Drop, I also have one outside, is one community developed project where we have, this is how our meetings sometimes look like, um, sometimes like up there, where we collaboratively come up with ideas and this and that. So Open Drop moves around liquids, it's best to show it moving. So in this example, you did not want the green dot to meet the blue dot as a game. But of course, in a real laboratory experiment, you might want to mix two liquids. This mixture leads to some reaction, maybe a color change, and this gives me some insight in presence of arsenic or food poisoning or certain bacteria and so forth. There's a little hole, um, so we can even look through these samples with these spectrometers. And yeah, and so a lot of these projects, they span from very educational rough prototypes to more perfectly engineered prototypes. Um, um, a lot of the work has also been done by my good friend and also partner called Urs Gaudens with the logo up there, Gaudi Labs. And currently they're working on an even stranger project. It's recycling old scientific hardware. What you see there is a DNA sequencer to measure the full DNA sequence of a human. The machine costs about one million and it's been thrown away because it's the first generation, it's not supported anymore, it's too expensive to run, so all the big companies and research labs don't use them anymore. But of course it's closed source software, so if you want to use a new application or program a new application, just using the microscope and lasers that are in there, my friends are now working on an open source kind of API or something, I'm not a software guy. So other people can find new application of recycled hardware. Um, but I want to finish with just like an announcement. So with Hacteria and many other groups, like Public Lab, some research laboratories that work on similar projects, we have started the global open science hardware movement. Um, we had a first meeting in 2016 at CERN. This looks, sounds really cool. Wow, CERN. 
but CERN does rent venues for public events, so they were not really involved, but just putting it there in the title, of course, gives you a publication in nature. Um, when I, I say open science, I don't mean access to science. I mean a very more holistic, inclusive way to do science, including society, um, including diversity in science, includes also including other knowledge productions of science, indigenous knowledge and some stuff like this. Um, and I think many people share this in that network um, compared to the open hardware networks. It's specifically about open science hardware to enable open science. And we did another event in Chile, and last year we did an event in Shenzhen, and we have a forum where we can discuss these projects with the four or five hundred people on it at the moment. Um, it has already spawned local initiatives, and we want to, as a network now, not organize another global event, um, but inspire people to do local initiatives. This is also why I'm here, by the way. We work together with FOSS Asia. For the last event, a few people came, and vice versa, I had to show my face here. Um, open science is here to stay. That's really something everybody says. There is groups in Cameroon, there is big European initiatives that this is the way we're gonna do it. Um, sadly, it's not there yet. You mentioned this already. Um, Apropedia is another good source. Um, it's huge, it's much more about uh, than uh, open source lab. There's also how to make a dry toilet and generally appropriate technology, but some people have digged out their own little zone about 3D printed laboratory equipment with a lot of links on it. Yeah, thanks. That's all. <laughs>